Hey Jerry, welcome to the Real Estate Ballers Show. How are you today? I'm doing well. How about yourself, V? Well, very good. Uh, trying to keep up with this tan that I got, you know. Um, anyhow, <laughs> so uh, tell us a little bit of uh, who is Jerry Ta. Who's Jerry Ta? Well, first and foremost, I would say you know I'm a husband, father of two. Um, it's kind of my personal life. Um, that's, I think that's probably the most important thing. And then second of all, I guess I do real estate uh, as a profession. And that's changed, I would say, over, I guess, the 10 years that you've probably known me or 10 plus years that you know me. Those that has changed over time, which I think is the same for most people, right? As you get into real estate. Yes. Yeah. We start, you know, real estate to me is a vehicle. And as we evolve and grow, our vision may change, our life may change. We may be wanting to do different things and someone, you know, sticks to real estate. Yeah. I want to say, uh, I, I would say that I generally do think that I have somewhat of a passion or personal issue with, um, which I, I think is kind of what drives me a little bit different than uh other people, I would say, and I'll say, for example, like I wanted to, you know, invest in when I first got into real estate, I wanted to invest in properties and then I did. Um, and then at a certain point, once you own a certain amount of properties, it becomes another full time job. So I looked around and I was like, well, I'd like to have a property management company manage my properties. And then I didn't really find anyone that I thought that really stood out. And I was like, well, Maybe that's something I can do. So I started a property management company. Um, and then I, I think at some point I had a foundation repair, a couple foundation repair houses that I bought that needed foundation repair. And you know, you know, it's kind of funny because I felt like at that time there was only one player in the game. Uh, there's a there's a company that started with a T, and then it was kind of like either their bid or, you know, good luck with whatever you're trying to do. Uh, so I looked around and I was like, well, there's not really many foundation companies. So then I started a foundation company. <laughs> uh, I, I have no affiliation with that company anymore. It kind of just wasn't really my thing, but I just found a need for it. I found a gap in the market. And then I was like, uh, um, I think there's a need for this. And I think the company itself still exists today. And I think it's doing well uh, from what I understand. And then more recently, I... Um, was well, I've used in our management business, we've used a lot of innovation companies. Uh, I use, I think, every single one that's in Houston at the time. Even the national one was my first one. And I've had terrible experiences with each and every single one. And, and as a result of that, I was like, I think I could do better. And that's kind of where I guess our discussion leads today is that I started a innovation company. It's been a couple of years now. Uh, still try to figure it all out. Um, still trying to develop the software, but ultimately we're, I think we're in discussion to talk about it. Well, so it's something I don't think about a whole lot and thank God for that. Right. Uh, we, we've done our work right up front to verify the tenants. So we haven't had to face many eviction. Um, but when we come to buy property from, uh, people, sellers and, helping them and assisting that unpaid tenants or tenants that don't want to leave. Uh, that's where, you know, we deal with more evictions than on our own rental properties. But let me just start you with this. What are the three common mistakes that you see people do when it comes to eviction? I think the first mistake right off the bat it's not starting the process right away, um, which is the vacate notice, right? Um, and I've 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 talked to this, talked to a lot of people about this. Is that, you know, in our everyday lives, for example, right? We we we're around certain people, and we're those people that we're around is people who we want to be around, right? It's because we have some level of trust with these people. 
Um, and then unfortunately, tenants lie. Uh, you know, promises, I would say tenants break more promises than anyone I know. <laughs> They're promised to pay at a certain date, at a certain time, at a certain moment. It's, it's, there's a better chance of being broken uh, than anything else I've seen in humanity. <laughs> it's like the, the chance that they won't pay is more likely than not. Uh, and that's not the case that we have with the friends that we decide to be around. Like, for example, if you make an appointment or to hang out with a certain friend at a certain time, the expectation is that they show up at that time or, you know, be there or call, reach out to you. That's definitely not the case with, you know, residents that live in your rental property. Okay. So number one is the common mistake that you see as a landlord is the not filing the notice on time. What was the two and three? You know, this even comes before, I guess the other thing, well, it kind of like, it goes hand in hand also that is that you treat your resident in your rental property as someone of a friend. I wouldn't say as someone's a friend, but more than just someone that you're kind of doing business with, right? So one lends to the other, meaning like you make a deal and then now you're treating them like a friend, which someone that you would trust in the example that I just gave that, hey, you promise that you pay, like you promise you show up at this time, but then they don't. So now you kind of blur the lines between you, you, you're making it greater than the arm's length of transaction, right? You're taking their word for it. And so you go from not filing, taking their word for it. And now you're treating them more than just someone that you're doing business with. Okay. So let's just like go into the most intense, the worst case of eviction notice, the uh, vacating a tenant that you've ever seen in your years of as being a property management company or in a landlord. My most intense? I don't, I don't know. I guess you most complicated, mind. intense, your worst one yet. So I would say, uh, I didn't even get to point number three. I think point number three is the next step is that to take the second promise. <laughs> Which just means that they promise to pay a week from today and then you agree and then they break that promise and then you agree to, you you allow the second promise, which is that they'll pay a few days later or a week later and that they will come through at that point. So it just, it just breeds bad behavior because now you're just accepting with no penalty their additional promise that they'll do something that they've never, they've proven not to, not willing to do. So funny. I was just thinking of a book I read about parenting and it's the same concept with children. You said, okay, you got to put your game up in five minutes. And the next thing you know, you give them another five minutes and you keep giving them every five minutes and it's 30 minutes later. Um, right. And from what the book said was, you know, don't do that and just this is the time, and if you want to do one five minutes, that's fine, and then be done with that five minutes, but don't keep extending. And that's similar concepts to what you're saying with, with the tenants. you got to treat it like friend, but also professional relationship, right? Like human, I, I, I know some people, some landlord who may not, should not be landlord, where I feel like they treat their tenants a little rough, um, um, but we're not going to talk about those people today. So, <laughs> okay. um, so my, my most intense, uh, I would say my most like stressful, um, situation was actually kind of recently where we filed an eviction, um, and then we went to court, we won, and after we won the eviction in court, we ended up getting a 200-page legal document. <laughs> and it was like the wildest like legal document. I've, I've never seen anything like it. It was absolutely like just stuff that I, like, I've, I mean, I've reviewed contracts, legal documents and stuff. I've never seen anything like this. And it was actually some lady where they had like, they had they feel like they had a right to this land so they have their own government own government and law so like it's some something called aborigines or something like that and so she sent us this 
200 page legal document of i mean just like it was like this thick via fedex and i opened it up i'm like i don't know what this, is. this is your tenant we're talking about no it's not a tenant it was a client in our from our eviction business okay it's not not a tenant of ours okay and, and apparently she sent all those like 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 i guess like their constitution <laughs> Or something from their like country or her country that they claim that they live, uh, that they don't abide by United States law or anything. They have their own laws and they have a right to this land and the right to this world. And, you know, just imagine like I opened up this document. I'm like, I don't know what any of this means. And I don't know if it's really truly legal or not. Anyways, ended up scanning it in and sending it to my attorney and um, he just laughed. <laughs> he was like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it. Uh at all so i i felt a lot better so but i was at the moment i was extremely stressful from it so this was their attempt to after not paying rent try to stay longer than they are invited to yeah that's to show you what people would do right yeah i mean it was it was very like i said i I, uh, when I got it, I, I couldn't think about anything else, like, for a while until, like, my friend got, like, my attorney got back to me. I was like, I don't know what anything. He's like, dude, don't even worry about it. <laughs> so what did, like a... what did the attorney say? What was, was it, like, not admittable? Um. He said throw it away. Okay. That's <laughs> <Right. laughs> how big of a joke it was. It was basically what he, what I was saying was that, like, they think that they have their own laws and they don't abide by the, you know, the laws here. That they can create their own laws, that they have their own world, and that we could be in trouble if we break their laws. But their laws are not imposable in any way. Interesting. Mm -hmm. That was pretty wild. Okay. So now let's go back, uh, let's get on the track of, we're here to talk about con uh, eviction. And mm -hmm. obviously, they get evicted because they stop paying rent, stop uh, performing to the agreement of the lease. Right. Have you ever filed an evictions um, when they pay rent, but not, but defaulted or, you know, in other way, any other way? Or most of the time it's because of non-payment of rent. So we've done it, I would say, out of all the evictions that we've done, only once have we filed or something else. Mm -hmm. uh, and that something else was that they were incredibly noisy. It was, a, I think it was a duplex, mm -hmm. right? So they were not by themselves in this one unit. And the other, um, the other tenant was complaining to the owner. But I'm losing in court um, because they had video evidence of like, they, the, the two tenants didn't like each other. So one was complaining about the other, but obviously not giving the whole story. Um, and so, yeah, so we, 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 uh, we lost that one and it wasn't our fault because the owners, I mean, we, we can only evade based on the information that we're provided. If we're not given the full information, then we can't help you anything. Beyond that. Okay. Okay. So I'm, we're going to talk about what happened if you lose an evictions, but before we talk about that, can you share what it looks like? The process, maybe, you know, when can you, when you start and if it's a good, smooth eviction process, what it should look like uh, with, with the audience? Sure. So uh, everything is based on the lease, right? I would say the vast majority of leases rent is due on the first of the month. Uh, and there are certain leases that, you know, where people say it's not due in the first month. So whatever, when, whenever rent is due, and not, and for our example, we're going to say the first of the month, mm -hmm. that's the vast majority of leases. In theory, in, in normal leases, your rent is due on the first, and then after a certain day, whether it's one day, two days, three days, four days, five days, late charges starts. There's a difference. Rent is still due on the first, no matter what. Is when lay charges apply. Those are two actually two different things. There's a there's always a huge misconception on between lay charges and when rent is due. The rent is always on the first, and then lay charges can be applied on the fifth or the fourth or the third, whatever it is afterwards. But in reality, is that 
if late rent is past due right on the second of the month if rent is due on the first it's past due so in theory you can send a vacate notice on the second a three-day vacate notice on the second of the month most people would do it after the late fees because it just kind of works better mm-hmm. uh and that vacate notice when we're referring to a vacate notice is we do it by regular standard first class mail and that may work i would say that works for most courthouses uh jp courts Mm -hmm. not brawl um i would say almost in all harris county you can send a standard first class mail i actually got this from the judge where the judge off of clay road i don't think he's the same judge anymore but his recommendation was always send it to first class mail because there's an assumption that first class mail gets to the property within two business days of sending it so you can confidently say that you provided notice within two business days of sending in the letter for first class mail. Now, if you send it certified, you actually get notice when they actually receive the notice. So you can't, there's not an assumption implied. Well, you can imply the assumption via first class mail. So his, re- so his recommend, I actually heard it in person was that his rec- this person said that um, via certified mail, but he filed the eviction before the three days because he, he knows when they got notice. So he, he did it before the three days was up. So the judge actually said in person to him, like, hey, you should send it first class mail because there's an assumption within two days that they get the mail. So it starts with sending a notice. Right. And a notice can be delivered. It's not required in any form, but can be delivered by simply printing it put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it, and mail it. Yeah. Or you can deliver it to the property. Right. You And then if you want to deliver it in the property, this is what we don't do is that you have to do it, you have to post it on the inside of the door. It cannot be on the outside of the door. Um, people make that mistake really often. And, um, you know, we're, we're in Texas, we're in Houston, right? I personally don't recommend anyone trying to open up a tenant's doors, uh, you may get shot, right? Yep. I mean, just, just like I, 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 we, I sh- stay away from putting up, putting ourselves in danger of getting shot, right? Yep. So you can, you can do first class mail, which is regular mail, certified mail, or you can post it inside the door, and that starts the process. So generally, it's a three day vacate notice. So when the, when they get notice, three days from there, you can follow. After that, you can follow. The- Has the law caught up? to technology like can you deliver this via email i mean you can but it wouldn't it wouldn't be it's it's not hold up in court they will not hold up in court no okay um so once you file your and it's we're talking about three day notice to vacate so they they at that point have the option to either pay the rent or leave or not do anything it's a notice. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, people can, people can choose to do what they want. Right. Okay. So if once it's three days up and you still haven't gotten your the rent, that is, is that when you can legally file your eviction Correct. with the court? Yes. Okay. Talk to us about that process. So it is up to you uh, to determine what courthouse you have to uh, file the eviction, file the petition at. So it's generally a, they call it the Justice of the Peace Courts. Uh, I couldn't tell you what the huge differences are between courts, but it's a JP courts uh, that you have to file the eviction at. And if I think if you go to like the Harris County, like if your house, if your property is located in Harris County, you can go to like the Harris County JP Court website and identify which courthouse you need to file the eviction at. And it's up to you to determine which courthouse you need to file the eviction at. If you go to the courthouse and you ask the clerk there, is this the right courthouse? They will not answer that question. Or they sh- in my experience, they don't answer that question for you. Um, it's funny because we had one of our previous companies that we used for evictions, they claimed that the courthouse gave them the wrong information. And I'm like, I know that's a lie. Because <laughs> I know that they never tell you if this is the courthouse. It's up 
is it, it is up to you to decide. There's a map that you can determine where you're supposed to follow your eviction. If you follow your eviction at the wrong courthouse, they will take your money and then not allow you to evict. So you're just you're just out the money. If if you follow at the wrong courthouse. And the time too, right? Uh, time. It, yeah, you got to start over with a new courthouse. Correct. So, and I th I don't think you find out until the point that they're about to serve, right? And the 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 constable would be like, oh, this is the wrong court, and then you just lost quite literally about a month, probably if you followed at the wrong. Okay, so you go to the. Can this be done online, or do you have to actually go to the courthouse to file? So we we filed online. Um, I used to file. We used to file at the courthouse, and yeah. I think since COVID, he he had to be able to file online. Uh, so yeah, a lot of this is done on. Okay, so you it have to be notarized, and the file the forms have to be completely filled out, and they took do take payment. So there's a form, and uh, is this the generic form, or does it have to be an attorney draft up form? Like, can you find this form somewhere online? Yeah, well, all these forms are available on like the Harris County Eviction Courthouse or the Galveston County, or what is every county? So if you so if you just Google whatever county, Galveston, Harris, Brazoria, Montgomery, and then eviction, and then you, you should be able to find all these forms are available online. So you complete the form, you file it with the court. How much time typically between that time until um, the next step? And what is the next step? So you always have to follow the form. We do it online. I, it, it, there's a few websites. I think it's efile.gov mm -hmm. or something. So there, it's not a like from the county. So it's actually like the efile.gov website. And then they have to... Once you follow, it doesn't happen right away, right? Because they need to check your documents. Yeah. So they need to like receive, like receive the, your documents and confirm that it's correct. Mm -hmm. There's a potential that you did something wrong. Yeah. Right. Um, I I think why we're able to be of service is that sometimes these documents become overwhelming, mm -hmm. right? People don't know how to follow correctly. Like for example, people are always very interested in including late fees or some kind of fees in their rent. But if you look at the eviction form, it says quite literally just the the rent payment that's due, not anything else. And if you file incorrectly and you include other fees, you may lose the case because you filed incorrectly already, right? A lot of legal stuff is making sure that you follow the documents correctly. Uh, so you need to check the website and make sure that they have received it. And then it's in process. Um, and then after that, once they receive, they'll give you a court date. Now, this court date could really be anywhere from two weeks to like six weeks later. Uh, just very dependent on how backed up the court is, right? Mm -hmm. uh, some courthouses are a lot more busy than others. Um, but yeah, it's it, it could, I, I would say before COVID, it would generally be like two to three weeks out. And then after COVID, like some cases were reset, like, or set like six weeks. I feel like we've had one that was like two months out. Uh, so in all this time, you're, you know, you're out of luck on, you know, if your tenants are not paying rent then you're out of luck. For and most likely they're not taking good care of the properties either. No. Um, yeah. So during this time, so before the, so once your, your court date is set, the, the tenants need to be served. So there's a, there's a chance that when the time comes, they're not able to be, ser be served, right? Because no one ever opens a door. Mm -hmm. And then, then they have to choose alternate service, which is like some kind of certified mail. Mm -hmm. And that may delay the hearing date even a little bit later. So the process used to be a lot quicker. It has now come to be drawn a lot, drawn out a lot longer than it used to be before since before COVID, since COVID. So let's say they got served. Now you at court, right? That would be uh, if it goes the way it should. Mm -hmm. And then each side present their case and then the judge make a decision. And then what happened next? Let's say you went. No. Uh, yeah, so um, 
so in court, I, I, there's actually even like a certain courthouse that would even give you a script on what you need to say. You're supposed to keep it very basic, especially if you're just evicting for non-payment of rent, right? Mm-hmm. For example, I think I can still out like my name is Jerry Ta. I am the landlord for the property at 1234 Main Street. The tenants are X, Y, Z, X, you know, names. And I'm evicting for non-payment of rent for this amount of money. And like, you just, you're really supposed to keep it that simple. Um, a lot of times tenants will have grievances. Oh, the water heater was repaired. Those are unrelated mm-hmm. to the that hand. Usually judges, some judge would be like, stop them and just like, hey, we're here for not paying the rent. Have you, you know, not paid? Uh, some will just sit there and just listen to all the grievances. <laughs> uh, and then after they're done, then they'll be like, well, you're still. Uh, so, you know, if, if if you have all your documents, your paperwork filed correctly, right, because it needs to match which, what you filed, you should be able to win the case in regards to non-payment of rent rather easily because it's very, you know, cut very dry like it's it should be indisputable right uh fairly easily so after you win generally you'll get a letter uh they'll stamp it or i think they mail it to you now where you know you get the judgment for the plaintiff Mm -hmm. you are the plaintiff you filed a petition against the defendants which are the tenants and what's crazy since covid is that you'll get this letter in the mail showing the summary of the judgment which is you won the case for non-payment of rent. And I have an example here where uh, they'll send this letter, but the way that they send this letter now, mm-hmm. they're almost giving legal advice. And it's and this, this, this doesn't go for every courthouse, right? Is it to the landlord or to the tenant? To both. So, well, you, so both parties get the same, get the same letter. But you, they, they actually put it in here, and they st- they staple it like this, uh-huh. and the judgment is actually on the back uh-huh. of it, and then it goes like notice to parties attending to appeal. So they're almost even like providing legal advice to the tenants that you have the ability to to appeal, appeal. to if you want to, yeah. Which is which, in my opinion, is legal advice, which judges are not supposed to provide. Yeah. Right. And uh, it tells them that their rights to request an appointment, you know, of an attorney instead of an appeal. And then they also even send out a list of resources, uh, like legal line, you know, Houston volunteer lawyers and stuff. So this is included in the packet that they send to you along with to the defendants. Um, and this was not the case before. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. So if they appeal, they will get extra time. Extra time. And generally, it is a delay tactic for them to stay in the house a little bit longer. Yeah. I mean, you know, generally, like I said, for non-payment rent, these cases are very cut and dry. It's just, you know, whether you paid it or not, right? So it is a delay tactic. And then, you know, they take it all the way. You have to hire an attorney, right? Usually attorneys cost between $1,200 or $2,000 to help you with the appeal uh, on these normal cases. So, yeah, and then the appeal is all, is also not at the JP courthouse. It's actually at the county courthouse. So it's very highly recommended that you do get an attorney. Not saying you can't defend yourself, but um, let's just say they're not as friendly if you don't know the legal process. Because right. now it'll become a civil case. Right. Um. So, yeah, so it's... Eh. It becomes very expensive. Yeah. Uh, obviously, now, you know, you're, um, I will say that the appeal hearing, some most of the time happens like a month later, a month and a half, maybe two. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you're counting the months and if you, you know, you're easily, what, two, three, four months out for no rent at all. Yeah. So let's say it goes smoothly and they don't appeal. Um, what do you do? So, if they do not appeal, right? So there's two things that can happen. Either they move out or they don't. Mm-hmm. Right? So if they move out, that's wonderful. That's best, best case scenario. Yeah. 
uh, uh, if they move out. If they do not move out, if they're still at the house, I think within six days. So they, so the defendants, the residents, they have within six days, see, I think it's six days, don't not quote me on that, to either file the appeal or supposedly move out. Mm -hmm. If they don't move out, then you can file what's called a writ mm -hmm. for possession. You have to do it again with the courthouse. It does cost more money. Again, you file a writ and basically is for the constable to come to the house and move the tenants out. Um, yeah. So, and that process, so basically you file the writ. The writ needs to be signed by the judge. And then the date needs to be scheduled with the constable in order to move the tenants out. That could go between two weeks to maybe six weeks is usually before you get the written the writ acted on uh, by the constable. So even in the best case scenario, it looks like it's gonna take this, the best case scenario from the time they stop paying rent to the time they out of the house. It looks like it's gonna take six weeks, thereabout. I would say best best case. Yeah. Otherwise, it could go to eight, eight weeks or longer. Yeah. Um. So then, what did it? It, it sounds really unfair, right? As a landlord, like you work hard and you buy this property and someone stopped paying rent and then at some point you have to offer to pay them to leave instead of going through all the other mess. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a very unfortunate, you know, like I don't wish it on anyone. Um, this is, is a very drawn out process and the likelihood that you're getting your house back your property back in a nice shape where you can put it back on the market. It's probably slim to none. Also, it's something that's going to require a lot of work to put the house back on the market. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so you're out even more money. Um, yeah, it's, it's not it's not the greatest situation. Like it's it really sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I, my worst one was when I was buying a house from this lady and she had somebody staying in her house. Uh, they wanted cash for key, but they wanted the cash before the key, given the key. Of course, of course right? Um, mm -hmm. But long story short, I think it still took, uh, because we, we filed the eviction uh, at the time. This was pre-COVID, so it's way easier then and... Uh, uh, they actually left when the sheriff show up after the writ was, you know, filed and uh, just signed and then the sheriff showed up and they left the property at that time. So, so you know, even when you do, for example, if the tenant does not leave and you file the writ, uh, you have to incur more costs. So we actually have to hire a junk company mm -hmm. along with a locksmith. Mm -hmm. Uh Ace that there's a lot of stuff left inside the house because they have to move out all the tenant stuff to the curb, and then you got to rekey the house. So you got to hire a locksmith along with a junk company to guys for to move the stuff out of the house. Um, we've actually had two very recent, like our, I think our most recent writ was a complete mess. Um, they were actually long term tenants, tenants that I placed in property. They've been living there for three or four years. Um, uh, and then for some reason they stopped paying and it, it, it appears that they may have been hooked, been addicted to some kind of drugs. So they were completely unaware that the writ was coming and they didn't even, they didn't attempt to move at all prior to the constables coming. So we had to move out a whole house and just put everything on the street. And, uh, they were just kind of off, you could say. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> like, oh man, yeah. But they were great paying tenants for like three, four years, and then I guess, uh, some they they came upon some kind of addiction and just wasn't there anymore. So crazy. <laughs> Have you, uh, you? So you don't serve the eviction notice yourself. You guys don't even. Yeah, that's that's good. So then let's talk about. So this is a painful expensive process right 
Nobody wants to have to deal with this. Do you follow any of the headlines about all these crazy stories that we hear about evictions and somebody got to stay? Uh, like, I think I saw something with a, a woman stay at this house for two years before she actually left, but she actually got paid to leave. Mm -hmm. Do you follow any of those stories? And do you think, are there truth to those stories? So we've actually come across um, a lot of situations many times now, not like way more than one, where our houses that we list for rent are also being listed on Facebook by someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, we've come across, I don't know if it's true or not, where people call and they're like, we paid a deposit towards this house. And we're like, well, that, you know, you got scammed. So, I mean, there's, there's a chance that certain people who are living in these houses unknowingly paid something to live in this house and they're not true squatters mm -hmm. so i don't want to hold judgment against someone like just because they're living inside a house illegally doesn't mean that they weren't scammed out of living in this house without knowing right so that's number one but there are the situations that you're talking about where people are actually squatting and it seems like there's a new service coming out where they're hiring like the landlord is hiring you know some guys and signing a full lease and making living live with the squatters and being making it very uncomfortable for the squatters so they can leave. <laughs> um, uh, which is, I, I mean, that's a genius business idea because the laws are just, you know, the squatter right laws seem to be in full effect. Uh, maybe I haven't really come across it personally myself here in Texas, but apparently, you know, in more tenant friendly states, uh, it seems like to be a big problem. Yes. Seems like a need for a new business, Jerry. <laughs> you know all, all those things are like fun and game you know, it's like when you're a kid right everything's fun and games or cool until someone gets really hurt right? yeah you know you always want to diffuse the situation not let anything get to some kind of physical violence or or someone actually dies and you know that it would be terrible that would suck right the idea is to pre stay far away from those things happening as much as possible Okay, so let's talk about how, what are the steps that a landlord should do to prevent, I mean, we cannot foresee the future, but there are certain things that we can do, you know, prior to signing a lease with someone to probably minimize the risk of having to do with an evic eviction down the line. Yeah. Uh, you should always screen, uh, the tenants doing a full screening report using whatever service tenant screen that you should use uh, and create standards um, that you stick to, right? I, I think it's as basic as that in all honesty. Like if you don't want to allow someone that has a 500 credit score, um, then you shouldn't. What you come to find out is that there are certain landlords that, you know, once their house is on the market for a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month, two months, they lower their standards uh, rather than their price <laughs> and then allow some attendant in that they normally wouldn't. Like, you, you get a little, there's a little desperation mm -hmm. uh, comes in and then um, you allow tenants. I think the other thing is that I think the most common thing, and I, I find it, I just kind of laugh at now is that, um, you know, when landlords ask us, do we interview the tenants? And I'm like, or what? Uh, you know, it's no difference than like a mortgage application, in my opinion, where if they're screening and their pay stubs and what they make cannot speak to whether or not they should be approved or not, then what, I don't I don't understand what an interview uh, would change. Other than they'll say that they're going to promise to pay their rent. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, uh, you know, like I said, uh, you know, it's a good promise to make as long as you keep it. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, in all honesty, right, like other than, you know, how much money you make, what's your credit score, do you, what is your rental history, what other things could sway you? Uh, in regards to allowing someone to occupy a property that you own. Uh, so I, my recommendation is to never 
uh, never ever talk to an applicant and hear anything beyond uh, maybe an explanation on what their income is. If there's, you know, obviously some people could be have their own business or self-employed or trying to determine what documents that you additionally need or something. Well, I think I, I can throw in another thing is if the tenants are represented by an agent and obviously that agents also want to earn a commission. Uh, mm -hmm. But when you're staring down at evictions, uh, that agents is probably long gone. So don't take the agent's word either. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> regarding the agents, I, you know, it's... I don't, we're, from a real estate agent perspective, you know, we're not, we're not looked at as an industry as, looked at highly upon, uh, and for a good reason, right? I think the standards to be a realtor is not very high. Um, and I, I get very frustrated when agents, like, for example, say they'll be a great tenant. I'm like, like, stop. Like you have no, you have no idea. Like, unless you're willing to put your money, your own money on the line, don't ever say they're going to be great tenants because you have no clue. Oh, they'll pay. You have no idea. Like, unless you're willing to vouch for them, per, like financially, meaning with your own money, if they don't come through, then don't, don't ever start with that stuff. Maybe next time, whenever someone say that, I just came up with this just now. Well, can you put up the additional deposit for them? <laughs> you know, I think that will answer the question really fast, right? <laughs> you know, I, I actually had, and I get in it with these realtors sometimes because, uh, for example, there are people out there, for example, they own a business and they don't report their income mm -hmm. should on their tax returns, right? And we use tax returns as, proof of income sometimes and then we'll have an agent say like oh well they make so much more money than that i'm like that's great that's great but i can't like you pay pay a full year in advance then uh if you have so much money right like if you can't prove it then i i'm not going to take it and they'll like oh well they, they deduct a lot more on their taxes i'm like you understand what it like anything like it's what you're remaining like if their business is 100% deducted from their income, then they have no money left. Then they're unable to afford a rental, unfortunately, from what I from what I can tell. Yes, totally. <laughs> okay, so. What are, what are some of the protections that you think that the, some ways that a landlord can protect themselves. So, like I said, number one, screening, create the criteria. Like usually, tenants need to make our our base requirements that they have to make at least three times the rent, right? And it's a yes or no, right? Is either they make three times the rent or they don't. And some some people will be like, oh, well, "Was close." Like you understand, three times the rent is a bare minimum. It's a minimum. <laughs> So if they don't make it, they're off by $100. They didn't make it. Like, yeah, that's a requirement, but that requirement is a minimum requirement. Like, I'm even a little worried if they only make three times the rent, right? So, I mean, if you want to make yourself feel a little bit better, then you make three and a half, four times the rent, uh, which, you know, life, everything is getting a little bit more expensive, right? Mm-hmm. Anybody that's just meeting the bare minimum requirements at three times the rent, they're very sensitive if price of food costs more or the price of, you know, gasoline costs more. They're very sensitive to it. So it may be more difficult for them to pay their rent if those prices increase. Some of the, you know, costs in their other lives increase. They're unable to pay rent going forward. Uh, we got a property lately in... Um... They came with, there were five applicants, and it took five of them income combined to to even, to barely meet the requirement, the income requirement of three times. That is very stretchy. Sure. 
Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't disagree. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, especially yeah, a lot of times it's hard. You know, it'd be, it, it's is what I've always come to find out is that like even like a three roommate situation, mm -hmm. a lot of times they end up n not getting along very well very soon. Right. They move it. So you'd be surprised. Like people just don't like, you know, they're friends when they see each other once a week. But when they start seeing each other every day, they're not great friends anymore. That's right. You got, you got internal conflicts amongst the tenants, which you didn't sign up for. Um, the other thing in, in regards to, um, tenant roommate situations is that, uh, I, I think when we first started and something we learned like pretty quick right away was that, for example, uh, if there was like three tenants, two of them, two would pay rent. And then when you're like, Hey, rent is, hasn't been paying. They're like, well, we paid ours. I'm like, that's, <laughs> that's not how that works. Uh, you all need to pay. So our system set up in such a way that. You either pay all of it or you can't pay it at all. So it's beautiful. Okay. All right. So tell us about, talk, uh, talk to us about your eviction company. Because I, I yeah. honestly, I, okay, sorry. Uh, I have not done an eviction personally. The only thing we do is, is to start a process. We send a notice. Once the, you know, then the next step is to enroll a, a, a an eviction company because uh, I'd rather not having to deal with that process because like you said earlier if you don't do it right and it takes a lot of time and resources so I'd rather outsource that area uh, of my company to someone else yeah so our company is called Evictions Help mm -hmm. um, website is evictionshelp.com uh, just how it sounds. And it's very straightforward. Uh, you know, you can just go to the website and enter the basic information. We only serve the county surrounding Houston, primarily Harris, Montgomery, Galveston, uh, Brazoria County. Um, and then you just submit your paperwork. And then we just kind of do from there. We verify the actual past due rent. That's due, less any, you know, no fees included. Uh, and then we do all the paperwork for you. Um, we make sure that we have the proper documents. Like you're supposed to have a ledger also, right? So you can prove out how much rent is past due. Um, and then we go to court. I think the biggest hurdles for landlords, right, is one is filing the eviction. Uh, providing proper notice, number one, is difficult. Like every step of the way, you know, if it's not something that you do on a regular basis, it's always it's always a little bit more difficult, right? We do this so much that we're familiar with the process. So, like I said, we've never failed. Some people are like, oh, I need to go to the house and do the eviction. Like, no, you can submit it via regular mail. Uh, we're very familiar with the form with Harris County. I think Harris County, for the most part, has one form, and then even the Fort Benton and then the Galveston counties, depending on which precinct it is, they have different forms for the very specific precinct. So you have to go to the correct one. Uh, and then, you know, like I said, it's a very drawn out process now. So like, you know, if it's not something that's happening right away, it's very difficult for landlords. And obviously it's in the middle of the day also, right? Courthouses, court uh, court hearings are in the middle of the day. So you're going to have to take off work if you actually need to go to the court. Uh, I would say a lot of our clients are actually out of town. So, you know, if you're out of town, then you have to come in to Houston in order to be able to be present at the court hearing. So we do that part for you. And that's kind of where it ends, right? So our service, that's like one part of our service is going from the following the vacate notice to following the eviction, the petition at the courthouse and then going to court for you. Now, however the rest of the eviction plays out, those are additional service, meaning the writ and additional service. Uh, hoping you know, getting an attorney, we work with a handful of attorneys and to facilitate that process is a different service than just the initial eviction process. So all those are add-ons or depending on where you end up with the eviction process. Uh, can you share the cost of filing an eviction? Yeah, it's actually right on our website. It's, um, this is inclusive of the court filing fees. Mm -hmm. So 
and this may change over time. So at the moment for 110 is 379 uh, to file for one tenant. So it, it, it depends on the co how many tenants are on the lease, right? Not how many you want there to be. <laughs> it's in accordance with the lease that you actually have. So if you have one tenant on the lease, then the cost is one. If it's two tenants, it's, uh, right, yeah, it's quick. Cause so it's 539, $539 for two tenants. And then it just kind of goes up from there. It's right on our website. Now that makes sense because an experienced investor once told me that they only put the tenants with the highest income on the lease. Just one tenant. They don't add, they don't put, you know, if there's like three, two or three, they just put one, but it's the tenant with the highest income. Sure. So. I mean, I mean, if you're worried about, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a very good thought, but ideally, right, like, the last thing you want to think about is that, like, I'm going to have to file an eviction on this tenant <laughs> uh, right away. However, and with that said, though, it's fun, kind of funny because now, like, as part of our lease, like, when we're leasing out a property, we actually prep the eviction form as we're doing the lease. <laughs> we just haven't <laughs> So it's already all filled out <laughs> with everything we need to do to file the evictions, and we have that ready all, also when we man on our properties that we manage. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, um, they, I learned quite a bit today, just in the process. And and I know that a lot of things have changed since COVID. Uh, you know, it's I would say it was way easier, faster pre-COVID, and now there's more step, more process. And it seems like if you got stuck with uh, one that know how to take how to work the system, the law, then you out a lot of time and money uh, for your property. So I, I would say, wouldn't you agree that as a landlord, you may sometime have to take your emotion out of it and just make a financial sense? Absolutely. Uh, I don't. I don't think you should ever put your emotions into it at all. Uh, which is why I actually don't know any of my tenants or anything. I don't know who they are, what their name, what they look like, nothing. I don't have a clue. Uh, everything is just business. You got to take the emotion out of it. Um, you know, I like to. I always, I always like to make a joke. Like you know, when people, like, like for example, if you're like, oh well, I didn't want to file right away. I'm, I'm just like, oh, it's a V charity. You know, like it's a charity. <laughs> But the, I didn't realize it was a charity, uh, you know, and, and not a business. Uh, so I just make the joke that they're running a charity that, other than anything else. Uh, they're not. So anything that we haven't covered today regarding uh, eviction? I would say I, I, the other thing in regards to courthouses is that there's the law, right? And then for some reason, uh, I mean, judges, I guess, have the ability to apply what they want to apply so de depending on which courthouse you're th at and which judge you're talking to they could have a different set of rules uh like i said i think my first experience one time i think there was a one precedent for ben where they required it uh certified and i was like okay well you're a, quite literally the only courthouse i know that requires certified um so again i think a good resource is to check that county's eviction, whatever, their website and see what they uh, require. Like I said, I, I never had any other issue with, um, we've done a lot. And I standard first-class mail has not failed us many times, like ever. Um, and on top of that, the burden of proof is, it's really easy to prove out if a tenant has not paid, right? Um mm -hmm. Meaning, if you have a ledger, right, if they paid every single month up until a certain month, it's pretty easy to say that, like, oh, well, you didn't pay. Um, so, yeah. All right. So, what would be the one thing that you, Jerry Ta, today, tell you, Jerry Ta, early on in your real estate career? Uh, today, I mean, I think the the easy rule 
a lot of times and potentially you could break your own rules is that you know easy money today may hurt you later on right let's just say you know when I was first renting out properties, like, oh, someone had their deposit in, ready to move in tomorrow. Uh, they, if they're ready to move in tomorrow, you might really make sure that everything is correct. <laughs> Versus, like, someone wants to move in, like, a month from now. They're like, those are the prepared, oh, their lease is ending, right? Yeah. That's when those really prepared people. Versus, like, I really got to move into the house tomorrow. I, got, I, I need a house tomorrow. I'm like, that's great. I'll take your money. That's generally like famous last words uh, that, yeah, you can move right in and move in tomorrow. <laughs> you know, really do your due diligence is what I'm trying to say. Do your due diligence and make sure that uh, the tenants are actually very qualified. Uh, the other thing right now um, that's making in the management, you know, resume, there's a there's a huge amount of fake pay stubs, IDs uh, out there. Uh there is at one point I felt like every rental application we we're getting had fake pay stubs. Uh, and it was just, we just couldn't verify it. There was something off about it. We okay. call it, if we have to go with the number, they didn't exist uh, as an employee. So something to be very careful. If it doesn't feel right, it's probably not right. Uh, just use your better judgment on approving people to putting in your properties because as we discussed here, uh, the eviction process is not fun. Uh, it's, it's quite literally emotionally draining, right? And it drains your bank account also at the same time. Yep, because you still got to pay your note, even though your tenants don't pay the rent. Yeah, your over your overhead cost still keeps going. And then like I said, at the end of it all, you're left with a house that's not, probably not in any similar shape that when you gave it to the tenants. All right. Well, Jerry, thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, we appreciate your knowledge and your time. Well, there you have it. Another exit strategy down in your book. Don't forget to subscribe to stay updated with more insight from our real estate ballers. If you got serious value out of this episode, please leave us a five-star rating and a love letter. For more real estate talk, join our Facebook group, RE Ballers. Thanks for being a part of the real estate ballers community. Stay tuned for more.